turns out he actually just sleeps all the time. Literally, all the time. <laughs> trying to get pictures of him in the Johnny. Everywhere. So, I didn't. He's not really. Yeah, I don't know. The thing is, I, I actually have, I actually have two cats. Uh, so this is my first one, the first cat. This is the other one. Her name is, um, uh, SeaTac Airport YouTube. <laughs> Come talk to me later, I'll tell you why. Uh, so we, we have, okay. Um, I studied these cats. They're pretty, they're pretty cute. I studied them. We have these two baskets. And this is what it looks like from the top. We've got two baskets and the cat sleeping. Right? One, one basket for each cat. But for some reason, I don't know why they do this. They sit in the same freaking basket. <laughs> <laughs> so I take a picture of them. I'm like, why are you guys doing this? What do you feel? And then, so they're getting annoyed with me taking pictures. And like, okay, we're annoyed. So they decide to leave. And then they both move to the same person. <laughs> now they're like, oh, why do they do that? I just, I don't get it. I really don't get it. Anyway, so enough about my cats. That's, that's not why we're here today. Let's do some actual real stuff. Um, I want to say, like, so I, I am not a keynoter. I'm absolutely not a keynoter. I am a programmer. I'm a hacker. <coughs> um, I'm not very good at speaking, I don't think. I'm much better at programming, so today what I'm going to share with you is I, I want to share some hacking on stuff. We're going to hack on things, uh, hack on Ruby, and then we're going to do uh, some Rails stuff. Like, I feel obligated to talk about Rails. I'm on the Rails course, and I probably ought to talk about it while I'm here. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about some open source stuff. Like I want to talk about um, doing open source, my experience with open source programming. And so I'm going to start off with uh, some stuff, some irresponsible Ruby leading from what uh, Steven was doing yesterday. I want to do some of my own here. Um, and mine is, like, I don't know, Steven was probably a lot more useful than mine is. Uh, but I'll, I'll show you here, and I think we'll have a little bit of fun. Uh, first, I want to talk about Ruby values. So these are the objects that you deal with in Ruby. Does any, any particular object, we call them values. If you go look at the C code, they're all called values. And there's two types. You can break them down into two types. There's immediate values and there's regular values. Just regular objects. Two types of objects, immediate and regular. So the immediate ones are uh, nil, true, false, and fixed numbers, integers. And this is right here is the formula for calculating uh, calculating what fixed numbers are immediate values. Any number that's greater than that formula returns to you or your architecture, that will not be a, that will not be a Value. I believe also floating point values are. Uh, I think doubles are doubles are immediate values as well. I remember. But these are so here's some immediate values and some interesting interesting aspects of these are that these objects are actually singletons. There's only one of them in the system. And what's kind of cool about them is that um, they're never allocated because they're just represented as integers. They're just stored as integers inside. Of them. They're never allocated and they're never garbage collected. So they just sit there forever and ever, and if you go check out the object ID of any particular one of them, they'll always be the same. And what's kind of cool is we can actually perform a few little tricks with fixed nums, and the stuff that I'm going to show you today, it only works in MRI, period. It doesn't work. Uh, it may work in other rubies, but it's not guaranteed to work on anything besides MRI, and you should never use this code in production that I'm about to show you ever. Uh, but you should try it. Please try it at home. Your laptop or desktop will be fine. The computer will not blow up, I promise. Uh, actually, does anybody remember configuring X on Linux? Like configuring the graphics card you go through? I used to configure the graphics card and there was yes, and there was this like X thing, and it was like you do X386 config, X586 config, you walk you through all the stuff, and then you get the graphics card section, and it's like, be careful with these values. Because you can blow up your monitor. Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> blow up my monitor? <laughs> so like, what the hell are you should have put in here? <laughs> Super scared. I never, I never actually blew up my monitor, but I'm like, so there must be accounts of this somewhere on the internet. So uh, if you've actually blown up your monitor and configuring X like, let me know. I'd love to know about the story. <laughs> anyway, so I want to show you a trick that you can do with fix them. Uh, if you take a look at the object ID, you just call object ID on it, 
and then right shift that over one, it'll actually give you back the value of that, that fixed number. So that's how you can tell the, the object ID mapping of these particular, these fixed num values and the pattern of these. We're going to do some interesting stuff with these object IDs. The first thing I want to do is look at regular values. Now, uh, let's look at, let's pull up a regular value in IRB and inspect its object ID. Let's take a look at that. So we say, okay, new object. And if you look at the inspect there, you'll see, ah, uh, there's some, some address there. And you may know that that address there on the second line, that's actually the address in memory. That's where it's located in memory on your, on your computer. Now, if you do object ID on that, we call uh, 2x16 and try to get out a uh, hex value in the object ID, it doesn't look the same as the memory location. You think, well, isn't the object ID the memory location? Like, I, you know, it must be unique. Uh, where is this value coming from? And well, it turns out that that object ID is actually related to the memory location. You just have to left shift at one. So if you shift that ID over one and then you get the hex value of it, you'll see down at the bottom that hex value is the same value as what was printed in the inside. So now we can see how the object IDs are actually related to um, the memory location of your object. So let's do something with that. Let's, let's fiddle with the memory. This is one thing I love about programming with Ruby, and actually one thing I like about uh, being a C programmer is that you can mess with memory. Just reach into memory and mess with it and do whatever you want to. There's no restrictions on it. And of course, like that means I have to deal with psyches all the time. Nobody likes that, but I guess I I don't know, hate myself or something. <laughs> anyway, so what I want to do is I want to fiddle with memory. I want to mess around with memory. We can actually do this in Ruby. I'm going to show you how. There's a library in the standard library called Fiddle, and what it will do is it will actually give you a Ruby object that represents a particular location in memory on your machine. This is how you do it. You say, okay, I want to get a fiddle, I want to get a fiddle pointer, you require fiddle, and you say, I want a new pointer, and I want it this particular offset to this location in memory, and it gives you that location. It just points right there, and you can treat it like an array. So you can say, okay, give me the uh, char value at that location in the array, and it'll just give you give you the value in memory with the width of the char. So you can see what that is. And you can actually set values there too. So you can you can actually manipulate the memory to set a value there. Okay. So let's do something with that. Um, let's take a Ruby object and get, we can get a pointer to the location in memory where that Ruby object exists. So this particular pointer there, it actually points in memory on your machine to where that Ruby object is. Okay. So we have a pointer there. We can read the memory, but what can we do? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look at how Ruby objects are implemented in MRI. This is the actual C struct layout of Ruby objects. So this is our this is our memory uh, our memory map for this particular value. You can see there at the top we have a struct bar basic. So that could be at the very head of every single Ruby object in the system. Okay. Now, all right. Let's take a look at what an R basic is. If we look at an R basic struct. We see that the first value is flags, and the second value is, what is the second value? It's a class. Okay, so we have flags and we have a class. Now, these are going to be at the very beginning of every single Ruby object in the system. So, okay, what is a value? You can look at the type of a value. If you go look at the header files, you'll see, well, it's a UN pointer, a key, and we can get the size of the UN pointer T on my, on my system, that's a width 8, eight bytes. Okay, so we know how wide a value is now, and we know where these values are stored in memory. So let's go read one. Let's go read one. So we have this object, we have our pointer to the object, and we say, okay, I want to read eight times off of that, for that size. We read eight times off, and we get this value. Okay, that's cool. So we got the flags. We were able to read the flags for this. Well, Flags are kind of interesting, but it's just a bunch of ones and zeros. I, I want to see something a little bit more fun. Let's take a look at a class. So we'll read another 8 bytes off of this. This says, okay, read 8 plus i plus 8, so we want to get 8 past the flag. So these are our values, and well, we know that this value is a UN pointer T, not a bunch of, not a bunch of um, char width values. So what we're going to do is use Ruby's path. 
put them together into an active integer. So you do that and say, OK, well, now we've got some active location there on line four. That's the location in memory of the class object. So we combine all those values together, we get the location in memory, and then we can get another pointer to that location. And we can see, ah, OK, my object is a type object. Down there at the bottom, we're able to pull that out of the C structure. OK, well, that's nice. Pull it out of the C structure. But it's nothing crazy. Why do we care about this? I mean, we can just call dot class on our object and get the same value. This isn't very exciting. What would be more exciting is if we could set the class. I would like to set the class. And the way that we do this is we say, well, OK, let's get the object, let's get the offset. Let's go through and actually write to that offset. So we get, it, we get the uh, string object, the offset for the string class, and then we go in and set that class offset inside of the Ruby object. So now we turn this O, this is just a normal object, and we turn it into a string. So I want to show you this actually in action. OK, so we start by our read. We say, OK, um, here we'll do implement the class equals, which does all the stuff we looked at in the slide. We included that in object, and we say, OK, let's create a new object. Great. I'll say o.class, class is an object, and we'll go ahead and set it to a string. Now our o is now a string, and it actually accepts the string. So this is, we're able to manipulate the, manipulate the class value on any arbitrary object in the system. So, oh, let's do some more. <laughs> that singleton class. Why do we do that? Yes. Okay, cool. We'll set that into a singleton class. We'll look at, oh, wow. Okay, it's something crazy. And now we actually have the LOL method on our object. So, all right. We're messing with objects. Never, ever do this in production. <laughs> um, if you do this in production, I will personally come. Um, Correct your code <laughs> and maybe correct you a little bit. <laughs> but all right, so it's all this crazy stuff, and it, it is crazy. But the thing is, like, I keep thinking to myself, you know, I love doing this stuff that's just crazy and, and irresponsible. But but you know, like, I have fun doing it. But I think, well, is it useful? Am I am I actually learning anything when I do this? Like, getting anything out of it? And I think that the answer is yes. I'm going to try to prove that to you. So let's, let's take a look at querying a Postgres database. So we say, OK, we connect to the database, and we're going to, we're going to select these values. We're going to select one through false and nil. And we're going to look at what Postgres returns to us. OK? So all right, we query it. We send that off to the database. And we say, give me the values back. And if we actually look at the array of values, we get the string one, the string t, and the string f, and then we actually get a nil there at the end. Right? Now, if you think about this, we actually have a problem because every one of these things, go to Flickr, every one of these things is garbage. Every time you get one of these values out of Postgres, we're going to have to say, OK, I've got to take this, this integer value and actually call 2i on it. So you take that string. You convert the string into an inter integer, and you actually throw that integer, or you throw that string away. Because you don't care about the string, you just care about the number that's in there. The same thing with the true and false. You don't care about the string t, you care about the true value, and you care about the false value. Now, we know that we're generating the garbage and just throwing the stuff away, but we also know about immediate values in Ruby, like nil, true, false. We know that none of those are ever allocated or garbage collected. So by messing with this stuff, we know, well, maybe if we go in and change the Postgres adapter, we say, like, well, let's just, instead of just returning the string one, let's just convert it to a one in C and then return that to Ruby and not generate this garbage anymore. So if we actually did that, we would get an array back like this, and we see there's zero time spent in the garbage collector here. These values get returned to us. None of these are allocated, and none of these are ever garbage collected. So the point I want to make with this is that having fun is not wasteful. We were having fun doing this crazy code, but we were actually able to learn something from that and take these skills that we can apply to and apply these skills to our real world, uh, real world applications and actually come up with some performance improvements to things that we may do in production. So having fun with this crazy code is never a waste of time in my opinion.
I mean, you probably shouldn't be doing it at work. I'm not sure my boss would be super happy to find out that I, I was setting the class on some crazy object. Um, but I was able to learn something from it and use this interruption code, use, my, use the skills I learned in interruption code. So the next thing I want to talk about is new stuff in Rails. This is stuff that hasn't been deleted yet. <laughs> For some reason, I have an incredibly bad habit of, like, I think, like, uh, I don't know, maybe 50% of the stuff that I'm in Rails actually just gets deleted. <laughs> But I think it's okay, like basically what my strategy is, it's like, okay, I know 50% of the stuff my commit's gonna get deleted. So what do you do? Double your commits. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about a couple new things that are in Rails, and then um, we'll move on to some open source stuff. So let's see, the first thing I wanna talk about is uh, UUID primary keys and Postgres. So in Rails 4, you'll be able to use um, UUIDs as primary keys if you're using Postgres. The advantage for using UUIDs is that you have a place to shard. You immediately have a place to shard a random value that you can say, well, if you want to take this table now, you just split it up amongst a bunch of different databases. Where can I split this data? You already have a normally distributed key that you can distribute your data with. The way that you do that is you just say, okay, all my ID to be a UUID. And now you have a UUID in Postgres. And the next thing I want to show you is we actually have H store support as well. Uh, Postgres has a thing called H store. What this is, is you can store a hash inside of Postgres. So you can say, like, I want to store actually semi structured data in Postgres. And you can actually query on these hashes too. So you can say, like, okay, uh, give me all records where. Uh, the hash column has a key with the value, whatever. Uh, so, those of you that haven't web scaled to use Mongo, you can web scale your Postgres database instead. And we actually support, I didn't put this in the slides, but we also support JSON inside of your Postgres database too. So, if you have JSON columns, we can support that as well. So, I think that's really exciting. The next thing is that we have a faster test. This is the extremely exciting faster test. Okay, they might not actually be faster. We'll look at why they're not actually faster, but they seem faster. And really, um, I guess, like, perception is half the battle, right? If it seems faster, it is faster, right? <laughs> so let's take a look at Rails 3.2. If you run some tests, this is just my simple app here. I'm running some tests, and on my machine, it takes about 4.7 seconds. And if you run this against the betas or the RCs, Rails 4.0, you can see, oh wow, it takes 1.9 seconds. Wow. Same application, same test. It's reduced by almost half the time. That's crazy. Let's take a look at a graph. Oh, yeah. Graph. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's pretty great. Like, yeah. I worked a long time on you know, with this one. Uh, <laughs> I may not know this, but I, I mapped the maze. Jack, Jack uh, so how do we get how do we get faster? What how do Rails get faster with these tests? Where the first thing we need to do is we need to look at where the bottleneck is, and I want to show you find the bottleneck. Let's run. So let's run just one test. Rather than running the whole suite, let's just run one suite. So run one. One functional test, and that takes 1.7 seconds. Okay. Well, let's try the same test in Rails 4. <coughs> well, that takes exactly the same amount of time. That's interesting. Um, and now let's do, let's do another test. Let's just require the application itself. We'll just require the environment. We always have to require the environment before we run the test. So let's try requiring the environment and see how long that takes. No test. Just require Rails and be done. Well, that actually takes 1.4 seconds. Our test took 1.7 seconds, requiring, requiring the environment took 1.4 seconds. So we can tell that our bottleneck is actually just requiring Rails itself, requiring our libraries. Okay, so how does this fit into the test picture? Yeah, how does it fit? So the way we can discover how this fit is if we look at a regular old test path, great test path, and this is a simple test path, we run the test. It's outside of a Rails app, it could be anywhere. We run the test. We run it, okay, we ran our test. Now, if we look at the command that actually 
actually run the test as the number of votes as the output when we run rate. If you look at the command, you'll notice right there we run Ruby. Right? Actually, it runs Ruby. So we ran rate, running rate runs Ruby, and then the rate command runs Ruby again. So when you say rate test, that actually runs Ruby twice. Right? Once once to actually start up rate and once to run the test system. Okay? So if you think about rate plus rails, well, when you say, okay, we run the we run our tests, and then that boots up the rate file, that shells out, and that calls Ruby tests on all on all of our test cases. So if we think <coughs> about this, right here loading the application when we load the rate file. And then it shells out, and then again we load the application when we're running the rate, or when it actually runs the test case. So we're running rate test units that actually loads our app twice. Right? So now we understand why, why it was that when we ran rate test, it seemed so slow. Now if you run rate test, that actually loads your application four times. Once for the rate file, once for the unit functionals, and then also the integration. We're loading the application four times. We have multiple loads that we execute. Yeah. So I wanted to get rid of that one really. The way we do this is we say, well, okay, let's just require the file. No more shelling out. So this is basically what our new test task looks like. We say, okay, we're giving a list of all the tests and just require them and then exit. That runs all the tests and actually loads your application once because we load all the tests in the context of the now we have to challenge it with this. The challenge is that we have to switch the environment because if you think about it, well, when you run rate, how do we tell what environment your Rails application is running? We don't know. We just assume that it's development. When you don't tell us what environment it is, we assume that it's development. But when you're running rate tests, obviously we need to run in the test environment. So we have to be able to switch environments. But the problem with that is that your app is a single thing. So we can't just throw your app away and then instantiate a new one. There are some challenges with that. Uh, I already talked about what environment uh, rate is in. So the way that we do it is we say, OK, well, let's change the environment before the application runs, or before the, uh, the app loads. We'll look at the actual rate task. And if you go look at the Rails source code, there's a huge task for this. Like just, you'll see it. Uh, it'll say like, okay, are we running the test task? Yes, we're running the test task. Let's we'll change the environment to test and then load the application. So there's some hacks for dealing with, this, dealing with this. But we also have to deal with stuff like, okay, um, you have pending migrations. And we have to test your development environment whether or not you have pending migrations. So all of this just becomes like a huge headache. We have some crazy hacks for this. In Rails 4.0, which we'll see, but you know, if you think about the real solution, which I think we need to have in 4.1, well, we are going to have it in 4.1, is to remove the singleton. There's no reason your application has to be a singleton. I'm not, I'm not actually sure why the requirement was put there. I think it was a case of defensive coding where somebody said, well, you know, we don't want them to instantiate their application twice. That's obviously a mistake. Who would ever want to instantiate their application twice? So let's raise an exception when they do it. When really there's no problem with it. If you want to instantiate your application twice, who cares? Like, if you're making a mistake, just don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the newest stuff. Uh, I want to talk about caching. Newest stuff, I want to talk about newest stuff. Like, I want to talk about Rails 4.1. I'm tired of talking about Rails 4. Ah, this reminds me. Many of you have asked me, when is Rails 4.0 going to be released? Yes, I will tell you. <laughs> now the problem is, if I tell you the date, <laughs> it will be postponed. <laughs> <laughs> September 2012. 
Yes, it was last year. Okay, September, yeah. Um, so the real date, our current date is the 25th. So this week, like, should, or this next few days, we should have Rails 4.0 release. Supposedly. <laughs> that is our date. DHH announced the date. I want to stick to the date, so hopefully we will have it. And we'll not be late. Cross our fingers. So, yes, 25th. Alright. Anyway, on active record. Active record. I want to talk about active record. I want to talk about this in 4.1 because I'm really excited about this work. Uh, I've been working with a bunch of students. Um, from different universities, and uh, I don't really have time to go into this, but I'll tell you, like, come talk to me later, and I'll tell you about the program. I basically, I was basically working on a program with uh, students from different universities around the world, and one of my students was working on this, working on uh, this performance improvement actor, and I'm going to talk about it. I'm shamelessly taking all of his work. <laughs> claiming it as my own. I'm just kidding. He did, he did most of the work, and I'm going to talk about the, uh, uh, basically what happened was I told him where we could do performance improvements, and he did all the work. So I'm going to present you these different performance improvements and tell you what he did. Uh, and the first way to understand this is we have to talk about the architecture of Active Record. So it's kind of, we're just going to talk about, you know, basically from the surface a little bit of nuts and bolts. When you say, when you do a query, something like person.where, dot where, dot where, dot where, blah, 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 we build up this uh, list that's basically a tree, well, it's a linked list of different objects. The first one is active record base, that's the class name that you call your uh, query on. And when you call dot where, we create a new object called an active record relation object. And that active record relation object points back to the active record base class. And then when you call where again, that creates another relation object which points back, and so on and so forth. Right? So then when we actually, we haven't actually queried in the database yet, we'll get to that. Then when you call to a or dot first or anything like that that actually causes the records to need to be loaded, or you try to iterate over them or something, at that point, that's the point where we query the data. So I'm showing you here dot 2a. You may not call 2a. You might call something else, but it will trigger 2a to be called. So we have this, this linked list of active record relation objects. And what happens is we instantiate an object here at the end called an error manager. And what it does is it actually generates a single AST, a tree. And it walks up each of these objects and adds to that tree. So it grabs the data off of each of those, each of those objects and keeps moving up until it gets to and by the time it gets to the end, then it has its entire uh, SQL AST. Then we take the SQL AST, and we actually convert that, we walk that and convert it into a string. So it actually gets converted into a string, and then we send that string off to the database, and finally get the results back from the database. So we have three transformations our code goes into. Your Ruby code turns into active record relation objects. The relation objects go to SQL AST, then SQL AST to uh, SQL statement, mm -hmm. and then we query the data. Mm -hmm. Now in the Rails 3.2 and greater, we introduce bind parameters, and you may have run into these. They should be basically transparent. You, you might have noticed in your logs, especially if you're dealing with SQLite, you'll see values that say like select star for people where ID equals question mark. Right? We're using bind values there. <laughs> the way these bind values work is whenever you send a database, uh, the query to the database, we say, okay, well, we're going to send a SQL statement along with these bind values, and we send them off to the database, the database makes some records, returns the records to our Rails application, and we live our happy life. Now, the first time that this happens, the database does a bunch of work. It parses that SQL, it plans the query, it executes the query, and it returns the result. Now, these four particular steps may change slightly depending on the database that you're using, but that's generally the idea uh, behind it. Now, what happens is when you're using a prepared statement, you say, okay, well, I'm going to reuse that original statement. I'm going to reuse the one that I had last time. And if you do that, then the database can say, okay, well, I'm not going to parse your SQL anymore because I know that you're reusing something, and I'm not going to plan the query anymore because you did that. I did that once already and cached it. I'm just going to execute it and send you back some results. So we save some time in the database. <coughs> Query plan is cached. The parse SQL is cached. So this was in Rails 3, 2, and 3. Right? But we can actually do better. 
think we can do better, and this is the work that my student did. So let's take a look at something. We have three queries here. We say, all right, we're going to find people where an ID is some value. All right, we have three different, three different queries here. Now, if we go and make a table out of these SQL statements that are executed and look at the bind values, on the left there is a generated table, and on the right there are bind values, you'll notice that the only thing that changes in this table are the bind values on the right. The SQL statement is always the same. It's always the same. The only thing that changes is the bind term. If we go look at our action, we can see, well, that's really the only dynamic thing in our code. We get a parameter that comes in from uh, the query screen. That's the only thing that changes. All those other stuff stays the same. And yet, every time this action is executed, on every action, we generate that relation chain, we generate the SQL state, the SQL AST, and then we generate that SQL statement again. We go through all of these steps and then query the database. All of those steps to generate the same string every single time. All of those steps. So basically what our plan was is, we know that these things never change. So let's cache them. All right, so we cache, we cache our invariants. This is the work that my student did. I'm just going to show you a little bit of the high-level APIs and kind of the performance improvements that we can get on this. So here's our high-level API. We say, like, well, here's our, here's our original relation object, and we're going to set the bind values on it. You just set the bind values to a random value, and then we actually perform the query on each two edges. Setting binds, setting the bind values will uh, just set the binds and not uh, expire our SQL string or our AST cache or the related cache. So if we run some benchmarks on this, I want to show you some benchmarks. First, we have a no cache, no cache um, test. So this would be our original implementation, like what you would normally use simulating a bunch of requests with this particular this particular query. Now we have our cached version, where our cached version, what it does is it actually caches the relation object, and you see right there, that's where we perform the cache. We only do that once. Then we set the bind values, and then we actually query the database. We set the bind, we set the bind values, and we actually query the database. And if we run this, so we have these two queries that are exactly the same. If we run this, with some names, and we just query on some names and age in the database, and we compare the two, we'll see, oops, right here, our cached version runs about 4,700 iterations per second, where our non-cached version runs at 2,800 iterations per second. So we can see here another very extremely scientific graph. Our cached version is actually much, much faster than our non-cached version. It's 1.68 times faster. And the way that we were able to accomplish this is that rather than doing these steps on every single request, we actually cached the first two steps. We were able to cache those and say, I don't want, I don't want to regenerate the SQL AST again. And those of you who are you astute watchers will notice that I'm not saying step three is cached. We can cache that. It's just that we haven't got to that. We haven't done it yet. So we're seeing these massive speed improvements only caching the first two values. We actually have more speed improvements. So I want to show you how the invalidation works very quickly. Uh, when you say post out where name equals x x x, we call two a on that a whole bunch of times. We actually cache that. So if you were to go do this in your Rails application today, this wouldn't query the database three times. It would query the database once and then cache those out. So if you go look at the branch that contains these performance improvements, you'll see this is actually the uh, implementation of the set binds method. It's really just this long. We say, okay, we're not loaded anymore. We don't have we don't have past records anymore, and I just want you to replace all the bind values. That's really the entire method. So we, when we do this, we say, okay, that first QA queries the database. When we say set binds, we invalidate that cache, and then we query the database again. And as I said, we can actually go even faster if we start caching that string itself. So I think we can do even better beyond. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, open source software. I'm an open source programmer. I want to talk a little bit about myself and a little bit about my job, how I got to have my job. Uh, I'm not talking about, I don't want to talk about your company. I don't want to talk about why your company should use open source software. Uh, I remember it used to be a thing like a long time ago, companies would say like, 
why should we use open source? I'm not going to do this. It's not supported. It's not, you know, I got to pay for support. I need my IBM WebSphere. Uh, <laughs> Those of you other former JCE programmers here know what I'm talking about. Uh, but I don't want to talk about I don't want to talk about your company using open source. I want to talk about you using open source. I want to talk about you. All of you. I want to talk about you, and I want to talk, I want to talk about me. Now, why am I an open source developer? Why do I contribute to open source? How did I get started? On it? The reason I started contributing to open source is because, well. I wanted to use open source to get work, right? I wanted to use this to show people, show people what I could do, and show people that I'm actually an okay programmer. I'm, I'm, I'm passable. You can hire me. I'm not going to delete all of your records, <laughs> most of them. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the history of this. I want to talk about my open source history. Okay, my my open source history and my history of getting work doing open source. Now my first my first open source started. Uh, I worked at a company called Classmates.com. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have told you that, uh, <laughs> but I did. I did it a long time ago. We had things. So uh, we had an Oracle database, and in this Oracle database, we stored. And basically, what this website was was a directory listing for uh, everybody in your school. Right, it was a school directory listing website. You could go look up, look up uh, other people who graduated in the same class as you. And what happened was we would store everybody's names, but we would store them in upper case. Right? And the reason we would do that is because Oracle's text search was faster if the name was all upper case. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> So, and of course we didn't store the name twice because disk space, I don't know why we didn't store the name twice, but we didn't. So what we had is we had a thing, this is a, uh, when I first started working in this company, it was all, it was a pearl shop. What we would do is we would take your name, take it out of this Oracle database, so all the uppercase, uh, and then we would do some text processing on it to correctly case it. For display, right? Now, many of you may know that there are other countries in the United States besides, or in the world besides the United States. <laughs> and people speak languages other than English. <laughs> so, very frequently, this thing messed up because we were casing, name casing for names that were like just regular American names, right? People, English speaking, United States people. But then all of a sudden, we, we started getting a lot of Spanish speaking people uh, registering for our website. And while the name casing rules for English names are completely different than the name casing rules for Spanish names, so this was my very first open source contribution was to this name case library, Perl, that was like, hey, here's a flag to put you in Spanish mode. <laughs> so this is my very first, my very first contribution to open source. It wasn't very much, but this was it. So after that I got serious. That, that my first my first contribution was in 2001, about or 2002. Uh, then I got serious, I got serious about open source in 2005. The way I got serious about open source was um, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> uh, it's 2005, Lord of the Rings, the third movie was coming out and it was coming out on my there was an early screen my birthday, and they were going to show all three movies on the same day, 12 hours of movies. And I was like, I gotta go to this. It's my birthday. I gotta go to this. So, so all right. They announced we're going to sell the tickets online. You go to this website at 10 a.m. Of course, 10 a.m. on work day. But I was a job programmer, that was fine. Uh, 10 a.m. on work day. Buy the tickets and then go, go ahead. Okay, so I log in to the website at 10 a.m. I work, and of course the website is completely crap. It doesn't work. Completely doesn't work at all. And I'm like, how are you It's still not working, not working, not working. I'm like, okay, well, I've got to get some work done. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a program that buys the movie tickets for us. So I, I start, I'm like, okay, in between compiles, because 
compiling our application took about 10 minutes. <laughs> and starting the application also took 20 minutes or 10 minutes. So I had a nice 20 minute break there where I could like, you know, <laughs> write Ruby code. So that's exactly what I did. I was writing Ruby code. I was writing a web crawler and mechanized to go crawl this website and actually buy these movie tickets for me. And yes, I put my credit card number in the Ruby file. <laughs> So I got a job working for AT&T 
developing normal applications for them, but I wasn't an open source developer yet. And the way that I became an open source developer, trying to tell this quickly, I know I'm going over time. Um, the way I became an open source developer is that uh, I was out with my wife one night, and we were, we were out at a bar, and we were drinking, and, and I was like, you know, I love program, I love programming open source. In fact, I know, I know you love it. I love programming open source. <laughs> I, I want to do this with my job. I wish I could be an open source programmer with my job. And she's like, you know what? You should do it. And I was like, okay, I will. What do I do? <laughs>
who uh, publish open source. So you can use this for marketing and improving your skills. I wanted to talk a little bit about my career of slacking off, but I think I'm mostly out of time here. Um, basically, like, I'll give you the TLDR. Uh, I was really <laughs> terrible in high school. Uh, I went to college, I got a job programming to go to college, and I decided to become a computer science major while I was in college, even though I was already a programmer for paper college. And then all of a sudden I started getting paid too much, and I was like, why should I go to college? So I dropped out, <laughs> and I moved to Seattle. And then I got a little bit older, and I understood that I actually loved learning stuff. Like, I just love to learn things. So I was like, you know what? I love being a programmer, I love learning about programming, I'm gonna go back to school. So I did. Went back to school. Went to college again. And uh, I applied to the computer science department at the University of Washington. And they turned me down because my grades weren't good enough. I didn't have very good grades in college either. I mean, I had decent grades, but not good enough. They turned me down. So I'm like, all right, this sucks. So I quit, dropped out of college again. And then later on, I was like, you know what? I, I really, like, I love learning. I'd actually like to get my degree one of these days. It'd be nice. You know, I feel, I feel like I'm an imposter. I feel fake. Like, I say to you that I can program, but I don't actually have a degree in programming. So I feel, I feel fake. I want to be a real person. No longer a Pinocchio, right? So I go to college again, and this is my third try. Uh, I go, and my grades are again too low. They, just, they decline me. Decline me in the computer science department. So I go in and I talk to the head of the computer science department. I'm like, look, I know that you guys take special situations into account. Like, you say, it says in the documentation, you don't base it just on grades, but you take people's situations into account. And I'm like, look, I'm already, I'm already a programmer. I've been programming for quite a while, and I would really like to get my computer science degree. And the computer science department had said to me, well, computer science is completely different than programming. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, F you too, and left. So that was actually the moment where I decided that I don't care about college. So I'm actually a my college. Everyone of these people is giving you an opportunity to participate in the community. 
Like this, I'll give you easy low hanging fruit. Like, how many of you developers before before yesterday, how many of you thought about doing accessibility in web applications? I imagine it's not very many. I know I didn't. I mean, look at GitHub, like that example, it's not, it's not very good. We don't actually think about this. So if you want some low hanging fruit, go find an open source project and add accessibility options to it. It's not that hard. If you can edit HTML, you can do it. So the other thing I want to bring up is Ruby friends. Take pictures with all the people here, meet new people, post it with a hashtag Ruby friends, and you'll see my picture on Ruby friends millions of times because I love taking pictures. People and posting here. So please do that. And I, I know I'm getting over time, I'm way over time, but I want to end with this story called Mama's Eye. Uh, so I am trying to lose weight. This is, this is a graph of my weight, but it's actually really upsetting here because you'll see, like, okay, over here, this is me. I'm in the United States here. US, US, US. Uh, I think something happened there. I went overseas somewhere there. Down here, down here, uh, Japan, Singapore, <laughs> India. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's climbing, this isn't good. So I hate exercising, I hate exercising so much. I know I ran the 5K this morning, but I really hate it. So what I do is I do a thing called uh, health walks. I go on health walks, right? And what I do is I just walk around the neighborhood, I walk and walk and walk, and I walk by, um, I, walked, I called health walks because I hate exercising, so I gave it a funny name, so I was doing it. Um, and I walked by the 7-Eleven, the 7-Eleven in the neighborhood, and I walked by, every day I walked by, go in, I'm like, you know what, I'm working out, doing this health walk, I need a reward. So I go in, and I love candy, love it. <laughs> so there's these little gummy things, this little gummy thing called Mambas, and this, this is what they look like. Yeah. I go in and I buy those. I buy those and you know, I buy them and I'm doing long walking because it's healthy. And then, like the next day, I'm like, yeah, you know what, I need a reward. I go in. And eventually, like the guy working at 7 Eleven, the same guy every single time I go there, and he says to me, if I have one name, he says to me, he says, hey, mama time. <laughs>
What? The entire audience has questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, questions. Yes. They don't have to be practical. You can ask, but they could be practical too. Okay. Hey, Aaron. Uh, great talk. Thank you. I, I just wanted to know, can you do a seg fault with Pibla? Can I do a seg fault with Pibla? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. So, um, you can access memory anywhere you want to and do anything you want to with it. So, you can absolutely seg fault, for sure. <laughs> and, and it's not a bug. <laughs> yeah, uh, great talk. Um, just a performance question about uh, you know MRI and JRuby and stuff like that. Sure. Where do things stand right now with Ruby 2.0? I hear that there's a global lock still in Ruby 2.0, so JRuby makes a better choice. Uh, you know, where is the adoption curve right now? And it's been like more than two to three years. Can you just give us some some idea where things are there? I mean, you're a JDE guy, a former JDE guy like me, so I can ask you, you know, maybe DHH would not like this question, they just use MRI. Um, so, let me, let me see if I get this right. Uh, what is the deal between the MRI and the JDE? Yeah. Uh, so, let's see. Let's see. Uh, I think that you can use JRuby and JRuby is still a better choice for performance. That is a loaded question. You can't ask it that way. <laughs> 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 So it depends on what you're doing. It always depends on what you're doing. If you're looking for startup time, obviously JRuby is not the choice for performance. Uh, but you're talking to the mature department. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So as, as far as application uh, performance over time is concerned, like um, doing hundreds of requests over time, uh, yes, JDM is definitely, I mean, it's definitely faster still, for sure. Yep. And if you want to do, if you want to do like uh, multi-proc stuff or multi-process stuff, JVM is definitely the one to go with. So I still prefer MRI. I have to. I want to review more things that happen. Yes, you're welcome. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for the amazing talk. Uh, so, uh, about Piddle. Yesterday, Osmaran took a talk about security and how you can uh, exploit a system. And he got into a Rails application system uh, because of the JSON um, vulnerability that we, that we had some time back. So, Fiddle is going to make it worse, I think. Um, so, have you got a chance to make, like, put some locking around or thought of how you could not, like, allow any uh, hackers to use Piddle in a bad way, right? I mean. Um, so, the question is, is there any way for hackers not to hack against people using Piddle in a bad way? And the answer is no, there's no way. Like, basically that thing, if you use, if you use Piddle, you can do extremely, extremely dangerous things with it. It is not, like, you don't, don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> use, it for having, use it for having fun, but I would definitely not, like, definitely not expose it to people, especially because of the crazy stuff I showed you in these slides, right? But the thing is, uh, the thing you have to remember is that you can't get, uh, it's very difficult to get people to load arbitrary code. And even if you got them to load arbitrary code, you'd have to inject something in there that said, okay, I need to execute some fiddle commands too. So it's extremely low risk, and if it was possible, this would be like a major, huge security issue. Like, I wouldn't worry about it. Just don't use it in your, don't use fiddle in your applications, it's probably. Yeah, I, I, because the reason I ask is I tried, tried thinking of um, I, I had searched uh, for like n allowing a gem lock, like uh, not allowing any user to not uh, install, be able to install gems or uh, require gems in a console or something, and I didn't find something useful. So okay. if you have, I'll maybe talk to you later. But if there's something like that, then yeah. So you're looking, you're looking for ways to prevent people from requiring files. Requiring yeah, gems, basically. Sure, or least. requiring gems specifically. Um, yeah, let's talk. I mean, there's various ways you can do that. Let's talk about it after. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> we have one, one last question, please. Yeah. Uh, hello. Oh, sorry. Here. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, do you see active support using refinements anymore soon here? Where are you? Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, do, do you see uh, active support using refinements anytime soon? Like, or is this, this that, like, uh, it's just impractical Ruby? Uh, my question is, will I see, do I see active support using refinements anytime soon? Uh, yes, not soon. Like, no, I think that it's online machine here that, that uses um, 
excuse me, use refinement in active support. Um, what were the problems I ran into? I ran into problems, I can't remember specifically what they were. Basically, basically it was backwards compatible, backwards compatibility stuff. If we isolate active support using refinements, then we need to get other people to use basically the refined version of that. So it's difficult to supply people with uh, backwards compatible, backwards compatible demand. We could probably do it in the future, but I doubt it would be any kind of thing. And actually, one note I wanted to say about using refinements, I think it's, refinements are actually pretty cool from the perspective of, okay, let's say you have a class. Okay, I'll say this really quickly. Say you have a class, and one of the methods uses like, um, something from active support, like, camel case. Or not camel case, so, uh, camel case, something like that. And you didn't require the file at the top, you didn't require active support at the top. <coughs> Your class has a runtime dependency on active support, but it doesn't have a compile time dependency. So you can load that class in, and as long as you don't call that method, then everything's okay, you don't get exceptions. Um, but what's cool about refinements is that it actually makes you bring that class in at compile time. So when you load the file, you actually have to reference that class, and if that class isn't there, like the active support refinement class, if it's not there, then you get an exception. So you can actually see what your classes depend on. Okay, anyway, yes, sorry, next question. Uh, so this will be the last question, uh, and I promise it will be a very, very short answer. But it will be a long, long question, though. <laughs> All right. The answer is yes. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Uh, I think you're far more interesting as a person than as a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> so my question to you is, uh, and I love cats, how old are your kid, uh, cats? How old are my cats? And I want that sticker. Ah, uh, yes, okay, so two questions. How old are my cats and can I have a sticker? Yes, you can have a sticker, absolutely, come find me. Um, the cat, the Gorbachev is about three years old and uh, CPAC, CPAC uh, Airport YouTube is... <laughs> She is uh, about a year and a half. I got so I got Gorbachev with a stud cat. Let me explain what stud cat is. Uh, <laughs> Did you see me fall on stage? <laughs> oh. He was a the male cat for a breeder, right? And the breeder did not want him anymore. He was done, and he said. What's crazy is he was done being a breeder cat at three. <laughs> <laughs> so the breeder was done with him and we're like, yeah, we'll, you know, we love him, so we'll make him. So that's, that's how we got him. We did not have him since he was a kid. He had a full life. <laughs> All, right. All right, guys. If you have any more questions uh, and you don't recognize Aaron, search for the man in the suit. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Thank you.